Good morning, everybody. So glad to see you guys all here. I missed you guys last week uh, while we were up at the main church for Easter. Uh, but anyway, uh, today we're continuing in our series, Break Trail. So uh, we were in the series for a few weeks leading up to Easter. And then um, these last two weeks of the series are all based off of what happened after Easter. And so we, we kind of specifically laid it out for, for that way for this reason. But before we get into all of that, all right, I want to throw something, a, a picture up on here. All right, this is a picture of KB's Twitter profile. Um, but if you notice, like, this left arrow pointing, or this arrow pointing over to this blue check mark thing, can anybody tell me what that means? Yeah? Verified. Ver verified. What does it mean to be Twitter verified? Anybody help me out a little bit? Anybody? What does it mean to be Twitter verified? Nobody knows? Nobody knows. Yeah, Grace? You say a lot of people like like views and stuff. Yeah, that might be part of it. Yeah, followers and respected, uh, possibly, but not all not all accounts with lots of followers are verified. Can anybody tell me what it means to be Twitter verified? You guys give up? All right, it basically means that it's really you. All right, it, it, it's really you. Like like I don't know. Like there's all those like other like profiles that are like real so-and-so and like sometimes it's the real so-and-so sometimes it's not the real so-and-so um, because anybody can make a profile of any name so especially like for celebrities and stuff like that that's really important to know that like nobody's impersonating that person especially like in this like kind of cancel culture that we live in it's to make sure that like nobody's being like yeah that's that's you know pastor joel and he said like all this crazy stuff i'm like it's not really me you know or maybe it is i don't know but uh it's to, to let people know like that really is you so that whenever something's posted from that that account that you know that that's really that person's voice that's really that person's opinions it's it's really that person making those statements or or, or whatever and so it's to show that this person is really who they say they are that it's not a fake, you know, it's not just like some fan page or, or fan profile and all that stuff. Like, I don't know if you know this, but like, there's even, there's even like Twitter accounts for people that have been dead for like the last like 30 years. Like, like one, one of the ones I follow is C.S. Lewis. Like I follow C.S. Lewis's uh, um, Twitter page. Um, C.S. Lewis was not alive when Twitter came out. Like, like, I know it's not his, like, I'm pretty sure that'd be fairly miraculous if it was. All right. But it's somebody who posts like all kinds of C.S. Lewis quotes, obviously not Twitter verified. All right. Because the real C.S. Lewis is dead. All right. And, and so you can, you can kind of get it. But, but you see today we live in a culture where like, there's many, many different types of famous people. Back in the day, you had like a few types of famous people. Like, like they were like a philosopher or like a politician. Um, maybe an actor, like a play actor, like a local play actor might be locally famous. Uh, but that was that was about it, right? Like there wasn't a whole lot of different types of famous, or if you're like some revolutionary figure, somebody who like, you know, like started big causes or whatever. But that was about it. Now we have famousness for all sorts of things. You know, like the more obvious things like actors, musicians, athletes, like those are all pretty typical. But we also have people who are famous for, I don't know, like, opening gifts you know like like anybody here watch like the the unboxing like youtube videos anybody like admit it if you like watching unboxing videos oh yeah like where you're like people are opening things and you're like like you made you made 10 times much money as i did last year like opening free gifts like like why 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 like, uh, like you know and, and uh yeah but that's that's a thing you know or, or famous for uh playing video games uh there's uh famous for putting on makeup, famous for just like going online and sharing your opinion about stuff. Um, well, there's, there's people that are famous for everything, but I don't know. I don't, um, and then there's some people that are famous that you're like, I still don't know why you're famous, you know, you know, like the Kardashians and, and stuff like that. You're like, just, just, just why? Why? I, I don't get it. But anyway, uh, but there's, there's also, believe it or not, there are famous adventurers out there. And, and you're like, well, yeah, like, like Christopher Columbus or, Marco Polo, like, yeah, you know, you're, you're like, Marco Polo, like, like that, that, he was a famous adventurer, but there's still famous adventurers today, and so one guy that I want to share with you guys, um, particularly about is, is a guy named Bill Irwin. Now, uh, you probably don't know who Bill Irwin is, uh, but he is a famous through hiker, all right, and why, what a through hiker is, is somebody who does, like, some crazy long hike 
that's like an insane amount of miles and requires an insane amount of days. All right. And so uh, there's people who do this all over, all over the country, all over the world, in fact, because um, there's through hiking trails that will go up like all up the Pacific coast from like bottom of California up to Oregon to, to everywhere else. Like we live pretty close to a very famous through hiking trail and that's the Appalachian Trail. How many of you guys have heard of the Appalachian Trail before? Probably almost all of you. Um, so the Appalachian Trail, or a lot, a lot of people call it the AT, um, that's the one that's kind of like in our neck of the woods. Um, but Bill Irwin is really, really famous for hiking the Appalachian Trail. All right. Um, can you can anybody tell in this picture why Bill is so famous for hiking the Appalachian Trail? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, he's blind. He is the first person to hike the Appalachian Trail completely blind. All right. Think about that for a second. Like, like I, I would struggle getting from this part of the room to that part of the room without like, without like hurting myself terribly trying to walk it, walk it blind. All right. He walked the Appalachian Trail. Now, how many of you, anybody here like to go hiking? Like, like people who like to hike. Okay. Now, if you've ever been hiking, especially on some like more intense trails, uh, one, one of the big tricks while you're hiking is to not die. All right. It's, it's a big thing that you try to accomplish when, when hiking a big trail. And, uh, and if you've done, has anybody here done the Laurel Highlands trail? It's probably pretty close or high part of the Appalachian trail. Any of those things. Anytime you go hike a place like that, you, you realize like when you get like, well, I'm saying you do something like not Duff park where it's like paved, but like I, I, actual trail stuff. One of the things that's challenging is, is the rocks are all like pointed and stuff. Like, like just the Laurel Highlands Trail, you have so many rocks that are like this. Now you're just trying not to break your ankles. Like every single, st like when when uh, Pastor JD and I and a couple of friends went and uh, and Adam Kaufman, we went and hiked the Laurel Highlands Trail. And every single step, you're just like watching your feet. Like w I saw zero scenery because the whole time I'm just like, don't break my ankles, don't break my ankles. And I ended up like spraining my knee terribly on that trip. I couldn't even finish it. All right, and uh, 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 and so now imagine doing all that blind. And, and that's exactly what Bill Irwin did. In fact, uh, he ended up writing a book about his, his journey, um, but not just his journey uh, called Blind Courage. And it wasn't just about his journey on the hiking trail, but his journey in life as well. Now, now one of the things, like, Bill got so used to falling on this trail that, like, part of the way through, like, he stopped at, like, a store and bought, like, shin guards and knee pads because he fell so many times. Like, like he, he went and it, now think about that for a second. If you were blind hiking the Appalachian trail and, and you fell that many times, you'd probably be like, yeah, I'm done. Like, like that, that, like after like the 12th time or the 200th time, you're like, yeah, I'm good. Like I did enough. Like I've accomplished something, but no, he went and he bought shin guards and knee pads because he fell so many times. He's like, I'm probably going to fall some more. Let's go get, get equipped for this. All right. But, but he wrote this book called blind courage and it's about his story, but not just his story, hiking the trail. Um, but leading up to that as well, you see, Bill, um, Bill struggled before that. He struggled uh, massively with, with alcoholism. He ended up uh, giving his life to, to Jesus in a pretty radical way. Jesus came in and totally transformed his life. And that's kind of what led him on to uh, the, doing the, the Appalachian Trail. In fact, uh, one of the things that, that Bill had said, uh, just, just a quote from him, is this. Um, this kind of articulates his transformation in his life with Christ. He says, the trail was a pilgrimage to share God's love with all those whom I met while hiking. You see, he saw this, uh, this opportunity not just as an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to go make a big accomplishment and hike a trail as, as a blind person. He saw this as a way to be a witness um, to other people, to share Jesus with other people. And that set his mission. That, that, that set his mission. But you see, it took a lot of trust for Bill to take this journey, as it does for any through hiker. You know, any through hiker, you have to trust your guide, you have to trust your maps, you have to trust your equipment, um, you have to trust your training, yourself, and your own abilities. And in Bill's case, he had to trust his seeing eye dog as well, which is really, really wild to think about. And so I want to give you guys a couple minutes to, to talk about, um, tr to start off our conversation today about trust. I want you to think about two things. You know, one is who's a famous person you would trust? And, and then how can you tell if someone's trustworthy? So I will give you guys about, about three minutes, three, four minutes at your table. Go ahead and start talking about trust. Oh, while you guys are doing that, shh, while you guys are doing that, Miss Joanne's going to come around and uh, drop something off at your tables. Uh, and we'd love for you guys to, to volunteer for 
uh, spring fling thing coming up here in a couple weeks, and here's some information about that while you're talking. All right, guys. So I'm just super curious because the 9 a.m. service had some really, really incredible answers for the first one. So I, I'm really curious, who were some of the famous people you guys said that you would trust? Like, go ahead and like, I'll, I'll call on you. Just shout it out to me as loud as you can. So it's so all the way to the back table. Brian Smith. I, I trust Brian Smith. Yeah. All right, give me some other really good ones for famous people you trust. Yeah. Who? I have no idea who that is. Danny Duncan. You guys said Danny Duncan too? You say, oh, Dan, oh, you say Danny Gokey? Duncan. You guys said two different things. Yeah. Ryan Reynolds. Okay. Yeah. Who? Uh, Olivia Rodrigo. Tom Holland and his dog. All right, yeah. Who? Mer Morgan Wallen. Okay. All right. Who did who did you guys say? Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Yeah. Adam Sandler. Tim Tebow. Good answer. Yeah. All right. So you trust Will? You're saying Will Smith? You trust him to defend you? All right. I, I got you. Yeah. Ben Roethlisberger. All right. So my favorite one, I don't, most of you guys probably won't even know who this is, but last service, my favorite one that somebody said was Rick Astley. And you're like, that's the one who does that. If you've ever been Rick rolled on YouTube, when you're like, when you're like Spider-Man five trailer, let me see that. And it's like, this is a Rick roll video, but that's the whole, like, you're going to build you up. Never going to let you down. Never going to turn around. Hurts you. Yeah. It's a, I thought that was one of the most clever answers of the entire day, and I wanted to share that with you. But anyway, so uh, today I want to take a little bit of a trust quiz with you guys, all right? And so uh, I want you guys to think about, uh, so you're going, I'm going to like ask you a question, like how you'd rate this on the trust scale from one to five, all right? I'm going to answer this one because this was a ridiculous question that somebody asked me last service, but which is better, one or five? Five. Five's higher, all right? So so one, like, not much trust. Five, four, lots of trust, all right? And we'll go, so just, like, raise your hand, one through five for each one. So first one, how trustworthy are you from one to five? Just go ahead and put it up. One, one to five, yeah, yeah. I would say a four for me. Not that I intentionally break trust, but sometimes I'm just an idiot, you know? So, um, all right. Next one, how easily do you trust others? How easily do you trust others? One through five. All right. All right. How much, how much do you trust fast food restaurants? How much do you trust fast food restaurants? <laughs> You're like whole like five. You're like, like I will eat off your floor like five. All right. That's the excitement from Ty. All right. This next one, I'm going to break up into three different parts. How much do you trust ladders? Ladders. Like, you're like, oh, I'll go up a thousand foot ladder. Okay. All right, bridges. What about bridges? How much, how many, anybody you get freaked out on bridges? All right. What about plastic chairs? You're like, I've seen it. I've seen them break way too many times. All right. All right, how much do you trust famous people to tell you the truth? Like when if you see like a famous influencer, you're like, oh, your your opinion probably has no nothing to do with how much money you're making off that product, right? All right, all right. This one's not on there. Politicians. How much do you guys trust politicians? All right. Zero wasn't even. Is that negative five? Did somebody give me a negative five back there? All right. All right. And then how trustworthy are your friends? How trustworthy are your friends? All right. You can take the average. The truth is you probably have some that are like fours and fives and some that are like twos and threes. Anyway, probably, I think it's safe to say though, in, in the room, we have a mix of trust levels. 
Some of you probably ranked really high on the trust scale in terms of how much you trust others. Some of you probably ranked really low on where you, where you are on the trust scale. Like, and probably that comes down to experiences. You know, probably some of you, you've never had like major things where like people broke that trust. And, and uh, maybe for others of you, you're like, man, I've had my trust broken in some pretty major ways that like really make me feel more guarded uh, about different stuff like that. And so today, uh, I, I think there's still a song playing again back there that's, uh, you guys can go ahead and kill it. So uh, anyway, it's like, every, it's like one of those songs that like the bass hits like every four and a half seconds. It's like, anyway, really distracting. But, but today we're going to be jumping into this, or talking about this idea of trust. And we're going to look specifically at this, this moment, this weak moment where a guy named Thomas, one of the apostles, um, really, really struggled with trust, especially trust in Jesus. And obviously, there's some, some really extreme circumstances that, that lend to this, and we're going to talk about that. But Thomas definitely gets a bad rap about the lack of trust that he had in this moment, because we often call him what? Blank Thomas. Doubting Thomas. He, he often gets called Doubting Thomas. But the truth is, of the matter is, there's many areas in, in Thomas's life that he showed an extreme amount of trust, that he showed an extreme amount of faith. And we're going to be kind of looking at both of those, those, those moments where, where Thomas was really strong in his faith, really strong in his trust, and those moments that he was weak in his trust and in his faith. And, and so we're going to jump into John uh, chapter 20 and talk about that. Excuse me. Uh, talking about, about this particular circumstance where he had weaker trust. And this is what it says in John 20, sorry, in verse 19. It says, that Sunday evening, so, so leading up to this, this, Jesus got crucified a couple days earlier. He's resurrected this day. Um, and some of the ladies, went, they went to go um, pre- prepare Jesus' body for burial even further because they weren't able to get the job done. They get there. The body's gone. Angel tells them, like, hey, don't worry. It's Jesus. Or actually, it's Jesus, but, uh, but he's, like, disguised. And then uh, they find out that, that he's resurrected. They run back. They, some dudes run. They're like, we didn't see him, you know, and, and all this stuff happens. But now it's later that evening. Um, that all this craziness is happening, and this is what happens next. It says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, afraid that the same thing was going to happen to them, what happened to Jesus. He says, suddenly Jesus was standing there among them, and he said, peace be with you, he said. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side, uh, and they were filled with joy when they, they saw the Lord. And, it, uh, and then again, he says, peace be with you, and he, he gives them some instructions uh, going forward and all that stuff. All right, but right after this, all right, Jesus, you know, talk, comes, he talks to them, he's in their presence, and then all of a sudden, in walks uh, Thomas after Jesus has, had already left. And, and so, so Thomas walks in, and everybody's like, dude, Thomas, you will not believe what, what happened. And it says, one of the 12, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And, and they told him, he said, we had seen the Lord. All right, and then how many of you guys have had one of those moments where, like, Everybody's talking about this thing that was like a really big deal, and you just missed it. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you just missed it. And, and uh, that, that, that happens to Thomas right here. He's, um, and he says this. He says, but he said, uh, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. All right? He's saying there's, there's no way I'm believing it unless I can see it, unless I can touch it, uh, unless I can, you know, with all of my senses know that this is true. I'm not buying it. All right, he is as skeptical as, as they could they could come in this moment right here. Like he's he's not buying it uh, one bit, and and I and I love love his honesty, uh, his upfrontness about this, about what big of a struggle this was for him. And you can kind of imagine what it'd be like being in a similar situation uh, to to have missed something so big, but knowing that there's so much riding on this. If 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 Thomas buys into this, it means one thing for his life. If he doesn't, it means something completely different. This is a life-changing decision that he's going to make based off of this. And so he's asking for a little bit more evidence. See, something that Thomas knew is, is the, the way that Jesus would have been crucified. Uh, I'll go ahead and throw up here. Here's a picture of, of the, the types of nails that would have been used uh, to, to crucify Jesus. These are big, nine-inch long, um, square, uh, square nails that would have been used back then. This is what would have been used to, to nail Jesus on the cross. See, Thomas knew that the way that Jesus had died was, one, a pretty surefire way that you were going to be taken out. All right? He knew that this meant what it, what it meant. And, in fact, he knew that there would be some direct evidence of, of anybody who came back from this, that there would be some direct evidence that they had gone through what they had gone through. 
All right, that that whoever whoever the, they, these guys are thinking is the resurrected Savior, he knows that this person is going to have some markings. This person is going to have some direct evidence that they went through the crucifixion that Jesus went through. That this is how he would know that this isn't some like magician who has like a secret twin type thing or or any of this other craziness. That this had to be the real risen Lord and Savior. And so he's saying, I'm not going to buy it unless unless I see it. All right, unless I see it first. And so he knows all these things would happen. And he also knew that that Jesus would have really, really died. All right, because one, the, the way that the Roman Ro, Roman soldiers, when it came to executing people, got really, really good at it. They, they had some pretty sick, twisted ways that they did it, including the crucifixion. And if you were a Roman soldier in charge of executing somebody, you did it really, really well. Because if you didn't, if you failed, if you messed up, if you didn't complete the job, then the next day you were the one up on that cross. Like if you if you like took somebody down, like, oh, they're still breathing. Next day you're up there. You're taking the same punishment that you were not able to execute on them. So if you're a Roman soldier, you made sure that they were good and dead before you brought them down. And, and so, and especially that last final piercing to his side where they, literally they, they, they take the spear through his ribs and all the way up to the heart to where blood and water come pouring out. At that point, you you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that person is dead. And so Thomas knew that if he really was the, the risen Lord and Savior, that he would have all these markings and evidence. But going back to, to, to our verse a second ago, I love what it says next. So it says, Thomas is like, I won't believe it unless I see it. And then the very next line like, like kills me. It says this, it says, eight days later. All right, eight days later, Jesus waits eight more days before coming back to like talk to Thomas. This means eight more days of these disciples arguing. Like, like think about any time you've gotten in a disagreement with, with your parents, your siblings, and you argued over something stupid. Anybody here like to argue over stupid things? You know what I'm talking about? And you just like, you can't drop it? Imagine Thomas, all right? Imagine Thomas, like, like seriously, guys, like, drop it. Like, I know he didn't, like, I'm not falling for it. You just want me to go out and get groceries and feel safe because you are all too, too chicken to go out. Like, like, I'm not doing it. Like, like, you can imagine the arguments. For eight more days, Jesus leaves Thomas on the hook, like, like wrestling, struggling, and, and, and dealing with this tension of, of worry and wonder, all right? But then it says after those eight, eight days, um, Thomas is with them again. It says the doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. And Pete, once again, he's like, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, and I love this, like, nobody's talking here. Like, everybody, like everybody's mouths are like, their jaws are on the floor right now because Jesus has walked in again, the resurrected Savior. And Jesus shows that he knew exactly what, Thomas was dealing with. He knew exactly what questions and worries were on his heart and mind because he walks in and he's like, say, all right, Thomas. He, he, says, he, says, this, he says, here's my hands. He says, put your fingers here and look at my hands. Put your hand in the, uh, into the, uh, the wound in my side. And he says, so he's saying like, I know exactly what you were thinking. I know exactly what was hanging you up. Here, go ahead, check it, test it. Like I'm right here. And then he says, he says, don't be faithless any longer, but believe, believe. And then what, what does Thomas do? He doesn't walk up. He's like, all right. Well, no, like he doesn't, do, you know, he doesn't do any of that. It says that, that he stops right there dead in his tracks. And he says, my Lord, and my God. He sees Jesus walk in. He has this encounter with the risen Lord and Savior. He doesn't have to touch anything. He doesn't have to test anything. He immediately recognizes and knows like, all right, I goofed up. It really is you. It really is you. And it's this amazing, beautiful picture of how Jesus shows up on the scene. And he, he actually helps Thomas in his doubt. He helps Thomas in his questions. He helps him in his worry. He doesn't, come, he doesn't come there. He doesn't bash him. He doesn't berate him. He doesn't tear him down. He recognizes why he was struggling. And he, and he shows up and he's there ready to help him out. See, Jesus recognized that, that in this moment, he recognized what Thomas must have felt like after the crucifixion, while he was wondering and worrying and waiting. See, Thomas, I'm sure, first off, he probably felt betrayed. All right, he had been following this guy for three years. Three years he had been building up to this big grand plan of whatever this Messiah, the Savior, was going to lead them to next. And all of a sudden, it was gone like that. That, that this, this plan seemed like it was over, and everything that Thomas had been investing in, that he, he literally left his life, he left his family, he left his career, all these other things to come follow this guy, and then next, he's, he's, last thing he sees is this dead corpse of Jesus. And, and along with that corpse, he thought, went all of his hopes and dreams as they sealed up the tomb. 
All right, and, and you can see, imagine he felt betrayed. Next, he probably felt lost. Like, I, my, my last three years, I've been moving towards this moment, and now it's gone. Now, now what do I do? Like, do I, do I go back to my hometown? Do I go back to my family? And be like, I goofed up. I was wrong. You know, I followed this guy, and, it, and it's all over. You know, like, he's, he's going to like, where, where do I go from here? Because every plan changed. He probably felt foolish. Like, like I just, I gave so much to this cause. I, I did so much for this, and now it's gone. Like, I feel like an idiot. Like, like how do I even go back to my hometown? How do I even tell people? Because they're just going to laugh at me. They're going to make fun of me. Like, weren't you one of those guys? You probably thought you were a hot shot, you know? like doing all that like miracle stuff and that, now look at you you know he probably felt foolish and then he felt devastated not just devastated because of the opportunities lost and all those other things but devastated because this is his best friend this is somebody who he deeply loved and cared for who was brutally murdered right in front of him and so he felt just devastated and lost see when when Jesus was alive Thomas trusted him deeply there's even this moment this this beautiful moment where they're about ready to roll into this, this city that was very, very hostile towards Jesus and their cause. And they're about ready to roll into it, and, and Thomas looks at, uh, and, and all the disciples was like, if we go in there, we're surely going to die. I, like, they're going to, they're going to kill us when we go in there. So what does Thomas do? Like, he has, like, zero fear. He looks at, he looks at the rest of the disciples. He's like, all right, guys, well, then let's go die with Jesus. He's, like, all in. He's, he's about ready to roll into the city thinking we might surely die if we do. He's like, let's go, guys. If that's what it means, then let's go die with Jesus. Like, that's how in he was before the crucifixion. After the crucifixion, he wondered if his trust had been misplaced in Jesus altogether. Like, was this all for nothing? Have I been following the wrong thing? Have I been, been chasing my tail? But then after, after the resurrection, after he meets him, it changes everything. Because from that mo- moment on, Thomas trusted Jesus more deeply than, than ever after the resurrection, so much to the point that Thomas, he ends up going and he becomes the missionary um, to, to, to Asia, that many Asian Christians today draw their spiritual heritage to the work of Thomas, that they, they, they look back at that moment in, in his missionary journey and say, he's the one that started this whole revolution in our country, and it started with him, all because of, of his work there, and, and so Thomas made this huge impact, so much to the point where he even literally died for the gospel later, that, that seeing the resurrected Lord changed everything to where he was an unstoppable force for the cause of Christ. And so I want to give you guys the, the next couple minutes in your guys' small group to talk about some of your, your stuff with trust, some of your struggles with trust, and, and how to build and overcome that. So go ahead. So going back a couple gen- or several generations before Jesus shows up on the scene, uh, there's a really famous king. You've probably heard of him before, King Solomon. Now, King Solomon didn't also, like us, didn't get to actually physically see the resurrected Jesus. It was something that he had hope in, this, this hope that would someday come, that this promised Messiah and Savior would come and one day redeem us all. All right, but, but Solomon ended up writing something very, very amazing in the book of Proverbs that definitely directly applies to, to our lives today. And this is, this is what he had to say. He said this, he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. You see, this is something that, that Thomas had to do. This is something that all the disciples had to do. This is what, something that every Jesus follower after this moment had to do. And that was trust in Jesus with all of our heart. To not, to not just lean on our under, understanding, but, but to seek him, to seek him and his will, and allow him to show us what to do, to allow him to show us ne- each next step to take. You see, for, uh, for the disciples, they, they had to trust God. Like, there was many moments that, where things were unclear. There's many moments where things were difficult or challenging, that they had to take big, giant faith steps and know that when I do this, what, whatever happens, I'm in the center of God's will. And if I'm in the center of God's will, then everything's going to be okay. Now, keep in mind, that means each of the disciples, you know, all of them except for one, they ended up dying for, for this cause. But every step of the way, they trusted Jesus to do something bigger and better than they could even hope and imagine. Going back to our story about Bill Irwin, the blind hiker who hiked the Appalachian Trail, I imagine, I imagine he wasn't just like sitting on his couch one day. He's like, you know what? You know what I should do since I'm blind and all? 
I should just go hike the Appalachian Trail. Like, like that's probably wasn't his first step, right? It was probably like, hey, I'm I'm going to head down down the street all by myself. I'm going to make it to our local. Like, as a kid, he's probably like, I'm just going to I'm going to go to the park. Like, I, you know, mom, dad, like I'm however old, I'm I'm just going to the park by myself today. Like, you know, like, what? You know, like yeah, I got it. You know, it probably started there, and then then one day he's like. You know what? I think I'm going to like start like just walking more, and I think I'm going to do like do the trails down at Duff Park. You know, like let's, let's pay like half of them are paved. Like, yeah, I'm just going to start there, and then from there he's like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do Laurel Highlands. You know what? Now I'm going to do the Appalachian Trail. You know, it started with bigger and bigger steps, but it started with those littler ones, and that's what Jesus constantly did with his disciples. Was he was constantly giving them bigger steps after bigger steps after bigger steps bigger chances to exercise faith, bigger chances to, to demonstrate trust. But each and every one of me started small. It, it started small with first it's like, hey, just come and see. Just come and check me out. See that I'm the real deal. Then it became, now, now come and follow me. Now, 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 now come and follow me and, and watch me do these big things. That, then it, before you know it, he's sending them out on like little mission trips, you know, and then them coming back and like reporting how it's going. He, he, he's given them opportunity after opportunity to grow in their faith before he sends them out on this big, massive journey to go change the world. And that's what Jesus is doing in your life now, is he's giving you little opportunity day after day to exercise trust in him, to exercise trust and to put it into practice. I know, I know before, before my, my wife and my family and I moved here to Pennsylvania, I remember how freaked out we were about that stage of the journey. All right, uh, I, about taking that big of a leap because we had been we were where we were at before for for eight years. We had we had built our entire career and and family and all of that stuff there. Like, like we we had made all these big big steps. You know, we we'd had um, Ari and Ainsley. We had Augie on the way, and all of a sudden we're thinking, you know, Ari's about ready to like he's in preschool. He's building all like our kids are building all these friendships. They, we've got this community and these deep roots established. And now God's calling us to uproot them and move them to Pennsylvania. Like, like that's crazy to move away from everything that's comfortable and familiar and, and structured and to change all that and be like, hope it works out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was scary. That was terrifying for us. But when we knew that we knew that that's what God was calling us to, we had to know that it would have been stupid for us to do anything else. You know, to do anything outside of God's will would have been crazy, you know, that, that we needed to put trust in Jesus and be like, all right, if this is what you're calling us to, then I know you have something, you have something beautiful um, through this journey. And so that's what I want you to think about is, is, is how to take those next steps in your journey, how to exercise trust in Jesus even more. And so I want to give you guys like, like the next like seven minutes to, to talk about that in your guys' small group and dig into what it looked like if you trusted Jesus more in your everyday life. So go ahead. All right, guys. So hopefully you guys are having some great discussion. Uh, but uh, we're going to go and wrap up here in a second. But, but really, the big, big takeaway from, from all this, the, the big thing that we have to think through is, is, so how do I personally trust Jesus when things are unclear, right? And, and the thing is, is we often don't struggle with trust with the, like when everything's going great. You know what I mean? Like, like when, when when Jesus and the disciples are going around and like they just like healed somebody who was like who like Lazarus comes like walking out of the tomb and like like there's just like this whole like resurrection thing all this stuff like like they're not like oh man like I wonder if I can trust this Jesus like no like trust trust is hard is hard as challenges tested when things are scary when things are confusing when when things are worrisome you, you know and so that's when our trust is going to be. Uh, most challenged, most tested is when things are unclear or when things are scary or when things aren't going our way. Like, like when, when my dad passed away or when Danny and I lost our first child or all these different things, like those were moments where trust was hard. You know, like, like when, when, uh, when I asked like Danny to like marry me and it's like, yeah, you know, I'm like, I'm not struggling with trust that much that day. Like, that's like one of those like, yes days, you know, but like when your heart's broken, when, 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 uh, when things are, are confusing or, or hurt, that's when it's it's hard to trust. So so how did how did Thomas and Jesus together work through his trust issues? 
first was, was, was he, Thomas was honest about his questions. All right. He was honest about what his hangups were. He didn't just like walk in and be like, okay, like, I believe you guys. But like in the back of his head, like, I don't believe it. You know, like, like he was honest, like he dealt with it. He, he posed very real questions he was struggling with so that those questions could be addressed. And so what does Jesus do when he shows up on the scene? Like without Thomas saying a word, he immediately addresses the very specific question that Thomas raised. So like Jesus walks in and he's like, here's my hands, Thomas. You want to check them out? You know, like, like he hits the question head on. All right. Uh, the next one is remembering what God has already done. All right. In that moment when Jesus shows up in the, uh, on, on the scene, like I'm sure Thomas has a flashback to all these other things that Jesus did the unthinkable. And then it's like, okay, I don't need to go up and touch your hands anymore because you're the God who does the unthinkable, <laughs> like, like, like the, the improbable, the, the supernatural. I, I'm in it. I, I get it. I, I, I'm in. I, 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 I see that you really are the real deal. And so Thomas remembers all the other experiences that, that Jesus has brought him through. And it's now a little bit more po- plausible to imagine that Jesus did this too. And, and then the third thing is, is we have to practice trusting. We have to practice trusting. Just like I said with, with Bill Irwin, it didn't just start with him being like, I'm just going to go do the Appalachian Trail tomorrow. Like it started with him taking one step after the next. And, and the bigger challenge, the next challenge, and the next challenge, and the next challenge. And when we do that in our faith, that's exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. He was constantly building up their faith and trust by taking them on new adventures every single day. And and every single day of your life, Jesus is wanting to challenge you. He's wanting to give you opportunities to trust him more. And he's wanting to make you, help you step out of your comfort zone more than you ever have before. And so when you do that, when you take those steps, Jesus will build your trust more and more to five years from now, where you're at in your faith journey. You can't even imagine it now, what God's going to be doing in and through you. But it starts with taking each of those smaller trust steps today. And that's my challenge for us as we break from here. So let me pray. Uh, Lord, I thank you for every single person in this room. Lord, I don't know how you're challenging each and every one of us to trust you. I don't know what that step is uh, for each and every one of us. But God, you are a God who's so intimate, who knows each and every one of us so personally that you have a specific plan and design in mind for each of our next steps in our journey with you. Something that you're going to challenge each of us, every one of us on this week. And Lord, I pray that you help us to step into that. God, whether that's being a witness in our school, whether that's resolving a conflict, whether that's trusting you in an area of our life that feels broken and hurting and trusting you to, to take the lead on that. And, or maybe it's just something that you're challenged to do, whether it's a habit to break or whatever it is. Lord, I pray that you help us to hand that over to you and to take that trust um, step with you um, this week. Lord, we love you, and it's your name we pray. Amen.